The Narrative Paradigm, Storytelling for Persuasion. What you can expect from this lecture is first, we're going to discuss the ideas of the idea of stories in our lives. Second, we'll discuss the narrative paradigm itself, and then we'll explore an example. Okay, here we go. So why are stories important? Well, stories are the way that we keep our memories. So if you think about anything that's happened to you in your life, right, the way that your brain functions is by keeping it as a story, right? You don't have just like a collection of facts. Think about something that happened last week, right? Time exists in the thing that you learned. Right? You might learn some facts, but the way that you learn those facts is understood in your mind as a story. Stories are powerful emotional tools. When we talk about ethos, pathos, and logos, stories are highly potent in that uh, pathos section. We form our identity based on our personal stories. So when we think about who we are as a person, we oftentimes think about the stories that have shaped us, the stories that really reflect our values, the stories that really are the things that we believe that we ourselves actually are. And stories are highly persuasive. Now, we mentioned they're powerful emotional tools, but they are highly persuasive. So if you can get people to be believing in a particular story, oftentimes this can be one of the most effective ways to persuade them to take a particular action or just to persuade them that a uh, fact or value is actually uh, correct and true. So the narrative paradigm is really this idea that stories create meaning, that stories are really involved in all of the meaningful experiences that we've had in our lives. Uh, it was created by a guy named Walter Fisher. Uh, he's currently actually a professor emeritus at USC, but he's taught all over. He's a very significant professor uh, and scholar. He was credited with formalizing Burke's dramatism, which we've talked about in a few other lectures here as well. So uh, if you've ever tried to read Burke, sometimes it can be pretty challenging to decipher exactly what it is that he's saying, unless you're a, a Burke scholar. So he's credited with formalizing Burke's dramatism, which uh, made it a little bit easier to understand. Fisher says that humans are storytelling creatures, and he goes so far as to suggest that we are homo nerens, storytelling beings, as opposed to homo sapiens, or rational beings. So what he's saying here is that it's innate in our nature to understand the world as a set of stories, as opposed to understanding the world as a series of rational events or as rational creatures who are able to act rationally. He says instead we act through the telling and through the understanding of the world through a set of stories. He also says that we make decisions based on what we consider to be good reasons, on the basis of what we call good reasons. And again, this comes into this idea of storytelling is that uh, when telling a story, we believe that the characters in the story are going to also be making decisions that we would agree with based on good reasons. And he explains good reasons meaning history, biography, culture, and character. So these are determined what we consider to be good reasons. And these, are all uh, these all come to be understood through storytelling. So not only are all of these ideas um, understood and, and shaped by storytelling, but they also can be reflected within stories as the decisions are being made by the characters within the story itself. So how does this actually work? Like if you were going to use the narrative paradigm for something, what would you actually do? Well, first, you tell a story to illustrate a concept or an idea, okay? The audience identifies with the protagonist, so the leading character in the story. We're using the term identifies here the same way that we've used it before with the lectures discussing Burke and this concept of identification. So you want the audience to feel like they have something in common with the protagonist. And like we said before, the more the audience has in common, and it feels like they have them more in common with the protagonist, the more likely they're going to share the same worldview and the more easily they'll be able to be persuaded. The protagonist will go through some sort of experience in the story that represents a particular perspective and worldview. And then the audience is then moved to adopt the perspective of the protagonist if they're convinced to identify with that worldview. Okay, so what we're trying to do here, if you're going to use this, is you're going to tell a story. The audience is going to feel like they would act the same way as the protagonist. They would feel like they have something in common with the worldview of the protagonist. And then you're going to show the protagonist going through something and try and get the, your audience to identify with that worldview. And then once you've done that, you're able to persuade them in a variety of different ways. So there are two tests to evaluate a narrative argument. We have narrative coherence. So this is uh, understanding the structure of the story itself. So, itself. so do the components in this story create a meaningful and consistent whole? And does the structure seem like it makes sense? 
Okay, so this is kind of like, does this make sense? Like, do, do these flow logically from one thing into another? Is it, does, does this really make sense? And then narrative fidelity is, does this story reflect what I know to be true about life experiences and human nature? So do the facts seem true, accurate, and honest? So this is like the accuracy of something. Um, does this seem like this is the way that it would actually happen? Uh, whereas the first one is, does this story itself make sense? So the sequence of events um, seem to make sense. Okay, so we have two different tests that we can look at when evaluating a narrative argument. Here's an example. So we're just going to have a couple of words here, and then I'm going to tell you a story. So the goals of this argument would be to get students to study earlier in the semester for the final exam. And we'll have our protagonist is someone named Jenna. Okay, so um, <clears throat> just to give you a little background here, if you're just watching this, one of the things that this class has is these terms to know sheets. And these terms to know sheets are basically all the different words and concepts that you would need to know for a particular week. And then eventually there's a midterm and there's a final exam uh, where those terms to know sheets would be um, really the, the bulk of the content that would be, uh, th that would really need to be understood to do well on the test. Okay. Uh, but if someone is, let's say, just going through doing the terms to know sheets and not really studying and just kind of, you know, we have a 16 week semester, you know, one of the terms to know sheets was 15 weeks ago and they haven't looked at it then that could be a problem. Okay, so the goal here is to try and get them to study earlier. So what I would say is I would, I, I've done this in front of the class before, just as an example. Say I had a student last semester who was sitting right over there in, in that seat right there. Um, so when I, I would point to a seat. Uh, her name was Jenna. And Jenna, actually, she was really, really smart. Um, she came to class all the time. She did all of the, all of the work. She was getting A's on all of her papers. Um, and she was tracking with us with those terms to know sheets. And she thought, hey, you know, one of the things that I can do is, uh, since this is an open note final exam, I'll just print all of those terms to know sheets up. And then when the exam questions come, I'll have all that information since I've already done it. And I'll just be able to look at it and I'll figure it out on the fly. And I'll have this in front of me since it's open note. I'll be cool. And unfortunately, Jenna actually got an F on her final exam. And Jenna, um, even though she was doing really well in the class, she went from, it dropped her from an A down to about a B minus because of that final exam grade. Um, and, you know, she could have easily understood the material. She understood everything, but since she hadn't really reviewed it and she hadn't started studying earlier, she thought that she could just print everything up and figure it out, but she ended up getting an F. So I really want to encourage you to make sure that you study earlier because, as I've seen before, a lot of people can be getting A's, but if they don't start studying and reviewing this stuff early so then they understand it, then they're going to, uh, unfortunately, maybe end up like Jenna. Now, notice here in this situation you've got... Uh, so stories ended here. Uh, we've got an example of someone who we're trying to make in a college classroom situation feel like it's someone kind of like them, right? Maybe they've been doing well in the class. Maybe they've been tracking. And even if they're not, maybe it's someone they aspire to be like. But then this person has a significant event where they get a bad grade and they want to, uh, the goal is to make it seem like, hey, this could happen to me too, right? You're trying to get them to identify with this particular person. Now, if they adopt the, the worldview of Jenna, who has now been redeemed, who understands, you know, that she made a mistake here, uh, then they would understand that they're going to be studying earlier, okay? So we've got this story that we're trying to convey, and we're trying to use that as a tool to create some sort of action. Uh, now, this one was made up, but you can get, you kind of get the idea. So let's just do a little reflection here on some of the terms that we've looked at. Uh, so first of all, the tests. So narrative coherence. Did that story make sense? Like, was it logical? Did it seem like we were jumping around too much? Hopefully it made relative sense in terms of the flow of, uh, of content. And did it seem like it was um, true and accurate? Did it seem like there was anything, you know, that didn't represent reality? Okay, so questions for you to answer. Hopefully we pass both of those tests. What about the concept of identification? Do you think that in a college class of students who are taking the same, uh, the same class, the same test, that they would feel like they have a lot of similarities with Jenna, our main character? Hopefully so. Uh, what about the concept of guilt? Do you think that maybe this audience felt some negative emotions because they were able to identify with Jenna, right? So Jenna, in this example, probably felt guilt, right? So she felt, uh, and we're, we're talking about this uh, in the same way that we talk about guilt, like the guilt redemption cycle from Burke. Uh, so guilt, some sort of negative emotion. So hopefully they identified with Jenna, and then when she had that negative experience, they felt bad too. Now, how would they redeem themselves? Uh, well, they can... You know, Jen is able to blame herself, right? So this is mortification here in this example. Um, but they're able to redeem themselves because they're able to say, well, I'm not going to act like that. Um, so they're able to purge themselves of this guilt by hopefully wanting to act in a different way and not have the same guilt experience that Jenna went through. So again, re redemption through mortification or victimage, uh, it would probably be mortification, right? We're saying Jenna is saying self-blame and we're trying to identify with Jenna. 
So what we covered in all of this is this idea of stories in our lives. We also discussed the components of the narrative paradigm, just the concept of the narrative paradigm. And we also looked at an example. So next time you're trying to persuade someone, maybe think about telling a story, thinking about finding ways to make it so the main character in the story has something in common with the people that you're trying to persuade. And you'll find that this is actually a very effective tool for creating persuasion.